Doreen Virtue and Holly Pivik discuss the new apostolic reformation. Stay tuned. Hi, this is Rod Saunders from Jew and Greek. Now, before we get into Doreen and Holly's discussion, let's cover a bit of the history of the New Apostolic Reformation, also known as NAR. And let me notify you up front that this is going to be a bit lengthy. But I think it's important to do a thorough discussion of the NAR in order to be accurate and help inform people adequately. Many theological watchdog groups attack the New Apostolic Reformation without even bothering to find out or articulate what it actually is. The title of the movement came from C. Peter Wagner, a former missionary to Bolivia and professor of church growth at Fuller Theological Seminary. In his book entitled Churchquake, published in 1999, Wagner describes the process of identifying and naming the NAR. For almost 30 years, I have carried the title Professor of Church Growth, I therefore became very interested when I began to realize that the new apostolic churches were the fastest growing group of churches on six continents. I first studied church growth under Donald McGavran, the father of the church growth movement back in 1967. He taught us that the best way to find out why some churches grow and some don't is to study growing churches. As I began to do that, I discovered that the essential methodology of church growth research can be boiled down to answering four crucial questions. Number one, why does the blessing of God rest where it does? Number two, because it is obvious that not all churches are equal, why is it that at certain times and in certain places, some churches seem to be more blessed than others? Number three, can any pattern of divine blessing on churches be discerned? And number four, if so, what are the salient characteristics of unusually blessed churches? I am writing this book in an attempt to address these questions in our world today. When I first began to apply this methodology 20 years ago, it was obvious that in Latin America, where I was working as a field missionary, the churches receiving the unusual blessing of God at that time were the Pentecostal churches. This was a bit embarrassing to me, because I had gone on record as anti-Pentecostal. Nevertheless, I swallowed my pride and began visiting and researching Pentecostal churches. I was amazed at what I found, and I reported it in my book, Look Out, the Pentecostals Are Coming. Pentecostals led the way in worldwide church growth during the decades of the 1960s, 1970s, and 1980s. By the end of the 1980s, missiologists had begun to observe at least three interesting phenomena worldwide. Wagner goes on to list those three phenomena as, number one, the extraordinary growth of the African independent churches in the early 1900s. Number two, the Chinese house church movement that emerged after 1970. And number three, the Latin American grassroots church movement in the 1980s and 1990s. All three of these share the same characteristic of being led by local believers with little or no Bible school or seminary training, rather than missionaries with a background in theology. As a man who had served on the mission field and taught on church growth, Wagner found this fascinating. In addition to these three, he also discovered that the fastest growing segment of Christianity in the U.S. was independent charismatic churches. This was around 1993, and that was when he began using the New Apostolic Reformation to describe this global trend in church growth throughout the 20th century. He wasn't emphasizing the office of prophets and apostles at that time. He was just observing the fact that churches were established without the involvement of missionaries, which some consider modern-day apostles, since the word apostle means sent one. Thus, the apostolic in the New Apostolic Reformation. Since this was a radical change in how churches were being established on the mission field, he considered it a sort of reformation of how church growth was being accomplished. Thus, the reformation in New Apostolic Reformation. Wagner had shifted his research from technical analysis in church growth 
back in the 1970s to spiritual analysis in the 1980s due to his association with John Wimber, who spearheaded the Signs and Wonders movement at that time. Although his background was as a cessationist, through his association with Wimber, Wagner began meeting other charismatics like Cindy Jacobs, Randy Clark, John Kelly, John Eckhart, Chuck Pierce, Heidi Baker, Bill Johnson, John Arnott, Shay Ahn, and Mike Bickle. Somehow his involvement in the charismatic movement and his emphasis on the NAR was interpreted by the critics and probably even a few adherents as a new movement within the charismatic movement, with Wagner being the leader of the movement, when in fact he was simply making observations about this global church growth trend outside of the traditional denominational church structure. But as Dr. Roger Olson said, the closer I looked at the NAR movement, the less convinced I was that it is a cohesive movement at all. It seems more like a kind of umbrella term for a loose collection of independent ministries that have a few common interests. I have examined the websites of several independent evangelists who claim to represent that affinity. So far, none of them seem blatantly heretical. Now, maybe his lack of condemnation of the NAR is due to the fact that he's anti-Calvinist and therefore lacks empathy for their hysterics on the matter. But Dr. Olson is a respected theologian, so it's hard to dismiss his opinion as trivial. In this first clip, Holly says that the Seven Mountain Mandate is something that came from NAR prophets. The Seven Mountain Mandate, I know you, mm -hmm. you mentioned wanting to talk about that. Mm -hmm. That is a revelation that many prophets in the NAR claim that they received, that the way to, to take dominion of the earth and bring God's physical kingdom to earth before Christ's return is by taking control of the seven major, major societal institutions. Now, many NAR critics refer to the Seven Mountain Mandate as one of the core doctrines of the movement, but in fact, the Seven Mountain Mandate didn't actually start with Bill Johnson or C. Peter Wagner. It began with Bill Bright and Lauren Cunningham in the mid-1970s. Bill Bright was the founder of Campus Crusade for Christ, a ministry geared toward evangelism on college campuses. He was also the one who created the gospel tract called The Four Spiritual Laws back in 1952. Lauren Cunningham was the man behind Youth with a Mission, also known as YWAM, an organization that promoted youth involvement in missions work and evangelism. Both of these organizations are considered mainstream, and I remember people in my Baptist church talking about the great work that they were doing nearly 50 years ago. Lauren Cunningham laid out what he called the Seven Spheres of Influence in 1975. He arranged a meeting with Bill Bright to discuss this strategy to impact our culture for the kingdom. It just so happened that Bill Bright had the same list to present to Lauren Cunningham. And a few weeks later, Lauren's wife saw Dr. Francis Schaefer on TV, and he had the exact same list. So naturally, they concluded that this strategy was given to them by the Spirit of God. It was basically just a plan to impact the various spheres of society through engagement in the fields of family, religion and church, education, government, media, celebration, which includes arts, entertainment and sports, and economics, which includes business, science and technology. In 2010, C. Peter Wagner took this seven spheres concept and renamed it the Seven Mountain Mandate. In 2013, Lance Wallnau and Bill Johnson of Bethel Church wrote a book entitled Invading Babylon, the Seven Mountain Mandate, in which they developed the concept further. Wagner said, Drawing on insights from leaders like Bill Bright and Lauren Cunningham, Wallnau has been able to popularize what he calls the seven mountains that shape societies. Here is his warfare strategy. If the world is to be one, these are the mountains that mold the culture and the minds of men. Whoever controls these mountains controls the direction of the world and the harvest therein. While there have been a few added components here and there due to the eschatological views of Johnson and others, the seven spheres are essentially the same as the seven mountains. 
So if you're going to condemn Bill Johnson for promoting the Seven Mountain Mandate, you're going to have to condemn the late Bill Bright and Lauren Cunningham as well, which I doubt that the critics will do since those two have been considered mainstream for half a century. Any sudden condemnation of them now would be a bit too obviously driven by theological prejudice. This strategy has nothing to do with a political revolution or the forceful establishment of a global Christian theocracy. It's just a strategy to bring about a cultural revolution through evangelization and discipleship. And it just strikes me as odd that Christians would label as heresy a strategy to impact our culture with the gospel, regardless of the eschatological views of those involved. Now, some of the critics will claim that the main issue here is the eschatological issue of dominion theology. But dominion theology wasn't created by charismatics. The Catholics had a form of dominion theology called integralism back in the 19th century in Europe. And the Calvinists had what they referred to as Christian Reconstructionism back in the 1960s. Dominion theology might be controversial, but it doesn't violate any of the essential doctrines of the faith. Just for the record, I don't affirm dominion theology in the sense of a theocracy or theonomy, nor do I subscribe to Kingdom Now theology. My eschatological views are pretty mainstream for an evangelical, but I refuse to engage in condemnation of end-time views that differ from mine. If there's any field of theology where a little latitude is called for, it's eschatology. In this next clip, Doreen and Melissa Doherty seem unaware of the post-millennial view. Because the Bible actually says things are going to get worse before Jesus' return and before the end of the world. Of course, Christians do hold different views about the end times. There are some mm-hmm. post-millennials who, who have h- held that, that um, the church will, um, will Christianize the world before Christ returns. And, these, and those people are not necessarily part of the NAR. Um, I, it's my understanding that even some of the um, American revivalists were post-millennialists, mm-hmm. like Jonathan Edwards, perhaps. To her credit, Holly points out that you don't have to be NAR or even a charismatic to hold to post-millennialism. Dr. Michael Brown elaborates on this point in his video about the NAR. In the 1700s and 1800s, what was widely believed in America was post-millennialism, that the church, through the preaching of the gospel, would ultimately take over the whole world, that the whole world would get converted and that Jesus would come at the end of the millennial kingdom. This was held to by major Christian leaders in the 1800s. Here, there's an article by Stephen Pointer on Christianity Today about this. And he says, during most of the 19th century, American Protestants believed they were living in special times, that current events were hastening the coming of the kingdom of God on earth. Hymns like the Battle Hymn of the Republic became popular because they so well expressed this hope. Mine eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. He is trampling out the vintage where the grapes of wrath are stored. He hath loosed the faithful lightning of his terrible swift sword. His truth is marching on. They saw it happening in their day. Undergirding this optimism, Pointer says, was the doctrine of post-millennialism, the belief that the second coming will take place after the millennium of blissful peace and prosperity for the church, which would be ushered in by the divinely aided efforts of the church. So they've... (laughs) Jonathan Edwards and his, many of his contemporaries believed that through the preaching of the gospel, the whole world would get saved and the whole culture would change. It's, it's very similar to a dominionism type of viewpoint, but even more comprehensive. Postmillennialism might not be the prevailing view in the 21st century, but it was in the past and wouldn't be considered heresy by the vast majority of the evangelical world. In this next clip, Holly says that Dr. Michael Brown has referred to the NAR as nothing but a conspiracy theory. We've even heard some um, popular people, I don't want to call them leaders, deny that the NAR actually exists. They almost treat it as a conspiracy theory. Hmm. Yes, that is definitely uh, something uh, that, that people are saying. Michael Brown has, has said that quite a bit. In fact, Dr. Brown acknowledges the existence of NAR, but says that the critics have created a non-existent version of NAR that is out to take over the world, which amounts to nothing more than a conspiracy theory. There, there is something very specific called the New Apostolic Reformation, which would have a certain number of people that would strongly identify with its principles. 
Then you make a bigger circle around that, a much bigger circle. That's all the Charismatics Pentecostals who believe in fivefold ministry today, but most of them never heard of NAR. Many of you don't know who Peter Wagner is, and many would disagree with many of the points that would be taught by Peter Wagner. Then you get the biggest circle. That's the Charismatic Pentecostal movement as a whole. From what I can see, the critics of NAR are taking all the abuses and problems in the larger Charismatic Pentecostal movement and grouping them together under NAR and then saying that it is somehow networked or has certain common beliefs or whatever. And this is untrue. It is exaggerated and it presents very false pictures. Let's, let's look at this website, six hallmarks of a NAR church, the Berean Examiner. The six hallmarks of a NAR church posted June 7th, 2016. So you scroll down and number one is this, apostles were in quote, a second apostolic age. There are new apostles on the earth today, anointed by the laying on of hands to represent and speak for God here on earth. These quote, super apostles, are equal to the original apostles. The ones who witnessed Jesus' life, death, and resurrection were appointed by Christ himself to the office. Since these new apostles are commissioned by God, their authority may not be questioned. Frankly, I don't know anybody who believes that. There's no one that I've worked with, including people that were part of Peter Wagner's organization that would be called New Apostolic Reformation properly, okay? I don't know any of them that believe it. If Peter Wagner believed that, I'm not aware of it. If he did believe that, I categorically reject it, all right? But I, I don't know anyone, people that use the title apostle today, I don't know any of them that believe that. In this series of clips, Holly says that the NAR prophets are bringing new doctrinal revelation, that Bill Johnson and Mike Bickle are leaders in NAR, and that the gospel of NAR is that we need to eradicate sickness and poverty from the earth. And prophets in the NAR can bring revelations, new doctrinal revelations that are considered to be binding on the entire universal church or worldwide. Uh, Bill Johnson, Mike Bickle, Cindy Jacobs, Rick Joyner, Heidi Baker, Louis Engel, these are names to watch out for, influential leaders in the movement. It's confused the gospel because many people in this movement think that is the gospel, the ta you know, taking dominion and, and setting up God's kingdom on earth, bringing heaven to earth. There's a buzzword, you know from Bethel Church, uh, uh, the idea that we're to bring heaven to earth by completely eradicating sickness, disease, uh, uh, poverty, all the world's problems before Christ returns. Um, it doesn't say that in the Bible, though. <laughs> it says it in Bill Johnson's book, When Heaven oh. Invades Earth. This is all nonsense, of course, and it's the kind of irresponsible apologetics that drives me to do what I do. In this discussion between Holly Pivick and Dr. Michael Brown, these distortions are dealt with handily by Dr. Brown. The year is 2003. The scene is a large church in Pasadena, California called H Rock Church. It was then called Harvest Rock Church. It was pastored by an influential apostle named Che On. On stands on the stage sharing with his congregation something that happened. A man came to him offering him a large sum of money on says he was surprised by the gesture, so he told the man, that's a lot of money. But the man said, I want to give it to you. You're my apostle. On agreed with the man that it was appropriate to accept the money. He recalled the story in Acts chapter 4 about members of the early church, the time when they brought all their money and laid it at the feet of Christ's apostles. At first, On was surprised by what the man did, but he accepted the gift. And then he shared the story with his church. This sent a message to them. They, too, should give their money to this apostle. So on is sharing the story with his church. And suddenly, a young man stands up in the middle of the service. He looks confused. He says, something is not right here. Something's just not right. His voice wasn't angry. He seemed baffled. It was like he was trying to sort out what was wrong about what was going on. On looked at him and said, you're out of order. Then a couple of burly men quickly escorted the young man out of the building. The other people stirred, surprised at what they had just witnessed. Then on continued on as if the interruption had never happened. Some in the audience that day may have forgotten all about it, but at least one person, Liam, still remembers. Most of the people saw a young man who questioned the authority of an apostle. He acted rebelliously. 
But Liam saw someone who didn't seem rebellious at all. He seemed sincerely alarmed. Why was he alarmed? He couldn't quite put his finger on it, but he sensed something unbiblical about the way the apostle wielded authority over the people in the church. I found the opening statement uh, both enlightening and, and shocking, to be honest, as, as someone that knows some of these folks personally and travels in these circles. I was just with Mike Bickle's sister, Mike Bickle from IHOP, at a recent meeting and uh, worked with Cheon in the early 2000s and no folks at Bethel. It's, it's kind of shocking to hear what's really a misunderstanding and misrepresentation. But the shocker for me was right out of the gate to use an anecdote about something that happened at Che's church, which sounded like the typical anecdote when someone has a problem in a church and leaves it and tells you how bad the pastor is and all the abusive things. Uh, I Every so often in 46 years of ministry, I've run into someone that thought that they were some modern-day apostle that had special authority over the church every so often, but I've never heard it from any of the people involved, nor would anyone I know think like that. Folks who are on the outside or who are mounting a lot of anecdotal evidence from people who are disgruntled now put this thing together, and, and you create this worldwide monstrosity. Because I'm watching all this conspiratorial nonsense coming up. And, and for example, I get blasted all the time on certain websites. I'm one of the apostles of Noor. I'm one of the apostles of Noor, and I deny it. <laughs> that's because it's not true. And that's probably why I wasn't interviewed in, in Holly and Doug's books. It is really unhelpful. When videos come out, I, I heard last year suddenly NAR is over controlling over 300 million people worldwide. This is bogus. This is nonsense. This, the debate and and is uh, that we show in our books very clearly and in, and even talking with leaders at the International House of Prayer. It's a debate about the offices, and uh, but they they never even address the offices in their statement, which is what the nature of the debate is about. They they say yes, that this, yes, they is, do. Uh, that this is about spiritual spiritual gifts. And no, that's not true. I'm looking at the statement, Holly. That's not true. They have a series of questions. All right. Question one. Uh, sorry to interrupt, but is, is IHOP KC part of the New Apostolic Reformation? Two, it, has IHOP KC had any organizational relationship to Peter Wagner? Three, does IHOP KC believe in the gifts of the Holy Spirit? Four, is IHOP KC part of a movement led by people claiming to be apostles? That would be the, the office there. No, I, uh, I, I, I do disagree. I think if, if you read that statement carefully, you'll see that the, that the issue of offices and because— It's there. I'm looking at Mike it. It's Bickle, there. Mike, there are Mike no Bickle. individuals with the title or office of prophet or apostle within the IHOP KC leadership team. There it is. That, office. Right, but that doesn't that doesn't say anything about their own beliefs and promotion in present day governing apostles and prophets, which is something that they have taught that uh, that Mike Bickle has affirmed to us that he himself believes in the present day offices of apostle and prophet and their own teachings and, and the apostle and the prophets that that have even in their own words guided their um, their ministry, their their history uh, there at the International House of Prayer. Not uh, guided. Not guided. I know them from the start. I visited it when the prophetic movement started. A again, you, okay, so first, their own, within their own movement, which is very influential, there are no individuals with the title or office of prophet or apostle within the IHOP KC leadership team. That's the first thing. And then second thing, when quite, they had prophets really among same. them, they were under the authority of the pastor. They were under the authority of the senior pastor. I was, I was talking with friends of mine that were working with them, and Mike Bickle often taught about how the senior pastor has to have wisdom if you have a, a prophetic person in your midst receiving things from the Lord. That pastor has to have wisdom as the senior leader as to how to handle it. That's, that was the issue. So let me sum up by saying that the three basic arguments against the New Apostolic Reformation are, number one, they're bringing new doctrine. Number two, they're promoting a heretical view of eschatology. And number three, they're led by people like Bill Johnson and Mike Bickle who teach heresy. There is no evidence that any of the people supposedly involved in leadership in the NAR believe in an open canon of scripture. 
Sure, they're charismatics and therefore believe in the modern operation of the word of knowledge and prophecy, but unless you're a hard cessationist like Justin Peters, you're not going to try to make that leap in logic that prophecy today would give us an open canon of scripture. And as I showed earlier, the post-millennial view of eschatology is hardly new, and it isn't heresy. And as for Bill Johnson and Mike Bickle being a part of the NAR, sure, they both believe in modern-day apostles and prophets, but not in any foundational sense. Bill Johnson doesn't acknowledge any involvement in the NAR, and in his books on the NAR, Churchquake and Apostles and Prophets, C. Peter Wagner doesn't mention Bill Johnson once. Mike Bickle, the pastor of the International House of Prayer in Kansas City, has gone to the trouble of refuting his supposed involvement in NAR on his ministry's website. I'll link to that in the description. The whole concept of the NAR that C. Peter Wagner wrote about 20 years ago, about a 20th century church growth trend in China, Africa, and Latin America, has somehow morphed into a 21st century heretical movement within the charismatic movement that is seeking to control the world with new heretical doctrines and dictatorial leadership tactics. Now let me say this. After reading what C. Peter Wagner wrote, I think a good deal of the blame could be applied to him. While he was a brilliant researcher and analyst regarding trends in church growth, as a practitioner, he was not as skilled or discerning. He was not a theologian at all, per se, and he was fairly new to the charismatic movement when he started writing about the NAR. He seemed to jump right into the extreme end of the charismatic movement without doing any due diligence about the potential pitfalls of theological trends that those of us who have a few decades as charismatics have learned to avoid. He wrote about vertical apostles, horizontal apostles, marketplace apostles, finance apostles, technology apostles, industry apostles, medical apostles, education apostles. It seems that his world was a virtual apostle palooza. He took what his research told him about church growth trends and tried to implement all of that under his domain in his golden years and ended up creating a lot of confusion. But that doesn't excuse the critics spreading that confusion around. Dr. Olson didn't get caught up in the NAR hysteria. A lot of level-headed theologians and apologists have also declined to join the fear-mongering. And of course, Dr. Michael Brown, who actually knows and has worked alongside of the people who are supposedly leaders in NAR, has sought to clear up the confusion only to be called a liar and a NAR apostle. How do you reason with people like this? I'd really like to know. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this video, give it a thumbs up, share and subscribe. And if you didn't enjoy it, you better watch out. The NAR's gonna get you. We'll see you next time.